Welcome everyone. We are thrilled you can join us for today's webinar, Stop the Madness. It's time to strategically evaluate educational technology and tools. My name is Kim Naraki, Assistant Director for Events and Programs at WCET. As we go through the webinar today, if you have any questions, please enter them into the question box and we'll get to them during the Q&A portion. We'd like to encourage you to engage in chat to contribute to the conversation. And if you put your questions in chat, we will probably lose track of them. We are recording and we'll share that with you as soon as it's available, probably by next week. We'll post a link to the slides so you can download those if you like, and you can follow the Twitter back channel using hashtag WCET webcast. Today's webcast is hosted in partnership with Turnitin. And again, if you have any questions, please enter them into the Q&A box. I'd like to introduce you to our moderator for today's discussion, who is probably a familiar face for many of you, Megan Raymond, WCET Senior Director of Programs and Membership. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. We have a great conversation in store for you. And I know you're probably wondering how to get started with inventorying and managing your technology. So we have several experts with us today. I'd like to go ahead and have them introduce themselves. We'll start with you, Omid. Please do an introduction. You're on mute. Thank you for the basics. Good to, uh, good to be here with you all. My name is Omid Fotuhi. I am the Director of Learning Innovation at Western Governor Governors University Labs, um, which is a nonprofit affiliate of Western Governors University devoted to innovation and research. Um, my own background really quickly is in social psychology and that's the lens that I apply to all of the work that I do. And I'm looking forward to being here with you all and, and engaging in this conversation. Thank you so much, Peter. Good morning, everyone. Hi, Megan. Uh, Peter Mosinskis. I'm currently serving as the Interim Chief Information Officer at the California State University Office of the Chancellor. Um, prior to that, I was serving as the Deputy CIO uh, at the Chancellor's Office uh, for the last couple of years, and uh, I've had about uh, 25 years of experience, maybe a little more than that now, uh, at pr public and private universities um, leading projects and uh, deploying technology solutions that support students and faculty. So glad to be here. I think this is a really important topic. Uh, and uh, let me hand it back to you. Thank you so much, Peter and Patty. Okay, thanks for having me today. I'm Patty Russ Smith. I am the Director of Customer Engagement for Turnitin. I've been here for about six and a half years, but I think it's important to add that I haven't always been on the private sector side. Um, I have almost two decades of experience in education uh, prior to coming to Turnitin. I like to say that I've done almost everything you can do in a school district, including serve lunch during a hurricane. Um, but I also have some experience as an adjunct professor at SU for a short period of time in their teacher preparation program. So I've really covered the gamut over the years. Excellent. Thank you. Well, wonderful. Thank you three for joining us today and sharing your expertise and experience with the WCET community. To lay the foundation for today's topics, I'll just start with a brief intro. EdTech is infused across course disciplines and modalities. Even in-person courses use EdTech to enhance student learning experience. EdTech was with us before the pandemic and with the growth of online learning, it's ubiquitous. Effective usage of tools for teaching and learning can be invaluable. Effective ed tech in tandem with high quality pedagogy can support equitable learning, achieve learning objectives, increase engagement, and aid in retention. According to a new survey from WG, WGU Labs and the College Innovation Network, faculty view themselves as ed tech leaders and want the time, resources, and input to effectively adopt and implement tech. I'll go ahead and drop the link to that survey in there shortly. We know EdTech has a vital role in teaching and learning. We know many faculty are well versed at using EdTech effectively. We also know that there was a proliferation of tools and technologies adopted during this pandemic, and many of us implemented EdTech at a rapid pace to promote remote learning. Now, how do you strategically evaluate and audit these technologies? Well, let's find out. I'll begin the conversation by asking questions to our panelists. I'll keep an eye on the Q&A for your questions too, and please do jump into the chat and share your experiences. And if you have any resources, please post those in the chat as well. So let's get started. 
What considerations are top of mind or should be a top of mind when an institution strategically evaluates current and future ed tech? What are the optimal goals? Patty, do you want to begin? Sure. Um, so I, I, th I think the thing you always have to keep in mind is sort of what, what are the goals and the outcomes that the institution is invested in and let that really drive your decision making. You know, so for example, if you have objectives that are really uh, centered on um, completion and certification, if you have uh, goals that are really centered on um, research, then you're going to want to look at tools that are geared in that direction. Um, I, I would I would say something that is probably a goal for all of us today is obviously this issue around equity and how ed tech can play a part in equity. Um, I, I think that's absolutely critical. But I think the first thing is to really know yourself as an institution and understand what it is that is driving your sort of day-to-day -day practice. And then look for goals that are going to help you meet or look for tools that are going to help you meet those goals and objectives. Um, it's sort of a backwards design process, right? Like in curriculum planning, you start with your end in mind and then you backwards map from there. I think you obviously should do the same thing when it comes to ed tech, right? You should be thinking about where is it I want to end up? Where do I want students to end up, instructors to end up? And then what are the tools that we need to put in place to ensure that that can happen easily? Excellent. Peter, Omid, either one of you want to jump in? I think to build on what Patty had mentioned uh, about knowing yourself, uh, I, I really feel strongly the same way. Uh, thinking about uh, maybe another way to look at it is sort of uh, fit for environment and fit for purpose. So knowing yourself, I think, means that you really understand what the environment of your, of your organization is and to what Patty said, you know, what, what are those values that you're trying to support? Are you trying to, uh, uh, the values and objectives, so uh, specific values, are you trying to uh, support equity? Are you looking to meet other institutional objectives? Um, and, and the fit for purpose really, again, is keeping that environment in mind, what you're, what you're trying to get to, um, how well ultimately, uh, can you understand the products or products that you're using to see how well it can uh, meet those needs. Uh, and uh, I think meeting those needs, uh, has everything to do with being where the people that are using the technology are and engaging them in an, in an active way. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll just echo, I think, what, um, what I've been hearing so far. Uh, I will say that some of the work that we've been doing with the College Innovation Network, uh, which is a collaboration with a number of higher ed, ed institutions, has revealed some actually some common barriers that even prevents institutions from getting to the point where they can begin to try to understand um, what their students' needs are and what their technological needs are. And if you'll indulge me, I'll quickly rattle off three of them that seem to be pretty prevalent. First one um, actually has to do with what we, what we are ca categorizing as market failures. Um, and in speaking with institutional leaders, we realize that there's actually a fair bit of distrust among administrators about vendors and providers, that there's typically a lot of aggressive sales tactics that leads to this distrust. But unfortunately, that means that there tends to be a resistance to including and inviting those providers into a conversation. What that also results at the aggregate level is that there tends to be a bias towards the well-established sort of big players in the marketplace, which ironically leaves out some of the earlier stage innovators and providers, uh, which is a, an antithesis to having more customized innovative solutions to meet your students' uh, emerging needs. So that's one of the barriers. The, the second category of barrier has to do with, let's assume that a school uh, knows what their, their, their technology needs are, which turns out it's not always the case, and they know what solution they want to implement. There is a change management barrier as well, um, which ironically has less to do with the technological processes to be able to implement, but rather the, the, the buy-in um, dynamics of the individuals who are at the forefront of implementing these strategies. And the third are challenges to evaluation. Uh, and the reason for this is that 
ed tech is not designed to be implemented in a way that is easily evaluated. And what I mean by that is that typically they're implemented all at once to all students without a comparison group. So that again sort of leaves a bit of a gap in terms of understanding how is this product actually impacting the goals uh, and needs that we may have identified. Um, and understanding that there are these, these various categories of challenges, I would say it's part of the beginning processes of trying to figure out how do we go about uncovering what we need, uncovering how we implement and uncovering how we evaluate, which feeds into this full cycle of understanding technology. Excellent, thank you. My my unmute seemed to have disappeared. So audience, we'd like to hear from you too. Jump in the chat and let us know what your institution's optimal goals are with technology and how you began to prioritize your tech investment. So moving along uh, on the theme of change management and barriers, why does this unchecked proliferation of tools continue to happen? And how can we shift the culture so that ed tech is adopted and implemented in a strategic way across the institution or, or across the system? And do we understand the forces that impact ed tech adoption among students, faculty, and administration? Who would like to start? Well, I'm happy to jump in on that. So, you know, why it happens, uh, I think, um, to some degree, it's because we're human beings and we approach solving complex problems in very human ways. And human ways to solve problems in many cases are iterative. They're messy. Um, they, uh, they don't always follow a, a particular structure. And a lot of times they're also driven by, of course, they're, they're driven by by humans, but, but there are other agendas uh, that may be uh, at stake as part of uh, the process. I think Omid was speaking to, to some of that, um, uh, th that challenge around this idea of change management and, and how, how the, the tie-in between what, um, what uh, either a group of individuals or an organization as a whole um, tackles and, and identifies as the, a, a single problem and how you get that group of, of individuals moving forward in a direction in a specific direction is tricky. I say this coming from the California State University system, which has 23 campuses, 480,000 students, uh, uh, 55,000 employees, uh, faculty and staff. So you can imagine getting 23 campuses to move forward in any one direction at the same time. Uh, it's a lot like herding cats. So you know, what works, what what overcomes some of those messy barriers? I think that's, again, to Mead's point, change management and having some discipline around change management is really important. Uh, also looking to build, uh, uh, to take those iterative approaches so that you're iterating um, through approaches, not doing things all at once. And finally, looking for opportunities to build, uh, build small coalitions. Uh, you know, we find in our system, that a lot of the things that end up growing beyond one campus, two campus, uh, two campuses, five, uh, 10, et cetera, really depend on having a core coalition of the willing around a specific approach, um, methodology, or, or even just a set of values that a group agree with and decide to uh, keep moving forward with, uh, those kinds of uh, coalitions a lot of times create their own gravity for moving uh, either groups or organizations in the right direction. Yeah, and Kim, I'll add to that. Um, I, I think that I, I think we can't ignore the factors that are outside of either ed tech or education, really, and that is there are policy and political wins that play a, a role here too, right? There's funding that are tied to specific sort of movements and trends that are out there, um, you know. And one of the things that happens, uh, and so in my in my previous role before I came to turn it in, one of the things I was is the grants administrator for our school district. And so anybody who's worked in grants knows that there are spikes and valleys and there are trends that lead 
those um, the sort of movement that's happening. Um, and one of the things that happens is you get pots of money that are available for very specific things that are time bound and have to be used in a certain way. Um, and that drives some of the decision making that institutions end up making. You know, maybe I'd like to add 20 staff members, but these aren't recurring funds and they're only going to last for two years and I won't be able to fund those positions beyond that. So instead, I might choose to invest in an ed tech tool, um, which can be a smart decision, but you have to be strategic about that and say, what are the goals that I was hoping to achieve? Can I achieve them with an ed tech tool, right? And so I think there's this real sort of strategic process that has to occur on a regular basis. Um, we used to call it PRP, right? pause, reflect, prioritize, right? So, and that can happen at any point in the cycle. It can happen in when you're evaluating tools initially. It can happen once you have a proliferation of tools. Um, it can happen anywhere along the compendium, but what you really have to do is stop and, and take a second and say, all right, everything that's out there, this is everything that's in the landscape, is it really working for us? And if it isn't, can we, can we modify our approach so that it is working for us? Um, or do we need to, do we really need to consider whether this tool is right for us? Is there another tool that would be better for us? And if I, if I jump back on the other side of the fence and think from the point of view of, of an ed tech vendor, obviously, one of the things that we really caution uh, customers about is really thinking about a full implementation cycle to understand what your concrete goals are at different points along the spectrum with implementation. And I will always be the voice in the room that says, please do not overlook the need for training, right? Because it isn't enough to identify a tool and put it in place and just hope that it will work. You have to have really, really clear milestones up front. And then you have to really think about how do we equip our instructors and our students, whoever those users are going to be, to leverage this tool to the best power that it's going to be. And you can't do that without some training and some deep understanding of what the tool is. Um, and, and so I, I I think some of these pieces get overlooked in the process of selecting a tool. We got something in place and we're like, okay, we're done. But honestly, that's step one, right? You, step two has to be, how do you get value out of that tool? Um, and so a lot of that really comes down to the users, whomever they may be, really understanding the full power of the tool and how to leverage it for their specific milestones and objectives. And, you know, in our world at Turnitin, we hear a lot of when you say, what are your goals for adopting Turnitin? Well, we want to catch students, you know, and, and prevent plagiarism. Okay, what does that look like? What would it actually look like if that were happening on your campus? What are the behaviors you would expect to see? What are the statistics that we can measure, right? What does usage look like that's going to drive that? So you have to really push people to be very concrete about those ideas because you're not going to know if it's successful or not if you haven't set really cl clear milestones and methodology for assessing the success. I think that kind of goes back to what Peter was saying. You know, you can't just throw it out there um, and and hope that people will pick it up. It has to be a lot more strategic to that, particularly at such a huge institution um, like his. You know, you're not going to get everybody on the same page in the same way that you won't hurt all the cats, but you can point them in the same direction and you can give them the right tools and they're a lot more likely to end up in the destination you had in mind. Yeah, these, these are <clears throat> fantastic points and um, I'll just happily build on them. Uh, thanks for setting the foundations, I think change management and uh, the sort of the pause reflect, um, you know, frameworks are, are critical. Um, and it, just on the change management, I think there's a change management set of dynamics that are important to recognize as well, uh, which includes, and I always try to promote an understanding of the barriers that get in the way of the change being able to happen. Um, and that speaks to what Patty was speaking to, which is how do you get a better understanding of the key stakeholders? And that includes the product, it includes the users, it includes the, the faculty who are sort of implementing them. Um, I will say that's something that's core to what we do again at the College Innovation Network. Uh, we have a series of surveys that go out to students, faculty, and now administrators as well to understand their perceptions because their perceptions matter um, in terms of how we hope to be able to implement uh, and, and create the change management that, that is necessary. And, and a couple of little nuggets that I'll mention, and, and this was mentioned earlier, 
Um, contrary to the Rogers adoption curve that, that we all know, which we like to sort of pick on faculty as being the resistors, that, that institutions, well-intentioned, well-resourced, will come up with great ideas and recommendations for technology. And then when they go to introduce them that the faculty are resistant and that that is what slows the change management. Well, it turns out when you, when you survey faculty, and you ask them, how do you see yourself? How is your appetite and what are your sources of influence and support as you're introduced to new technology? They actually don't see themselves as uh, resistors. They see themselves as innovators. Uh, but instead, what they do report is, uh, are some of the systemic barriers and challenges that either prevent a concerted, coordinated way of, of implementing solutions and evaluating those, um, as well as just a, a lack of clarity about where the influence comes from. So when you ask survey, a faculty, where do you get your motivation and inspiration for common tools? It's not from the institution. Uh, that's most commonly what that we hear. In fact, it's from what their peers are using. That's what they, they sort of are introduced in, in happenstance. So if, if you're thinking about trying to create a systemic change management program, uh, and yet your faculty are not seeing and hearing a clear and intentional um, strategy for introducing and supporting the, the implementation of new technologies. That's one of those pain points you might want to be mindful of as you're thinking about, well, how do we create a change management program that does target these barriers? Another nugget from our student at tech surveys uh, is also important because when we ask students, um, how, how is it that you feel about technology? We actually landed on a very new construct that hasn't been seen or explored in the literature to date. And this is what we're calling an edtech mindset, or essentially a sense of self-efficacy in terms of your willingness and your comfort in adapting and adopting new technologies. We take it for granted that if you just connect students to their learning experiences through the technological channels, that's a pretty seamless pathway. But in fact, navigating those technological channels themselves has its own set of experiences and training potential and barriers. And so understanding that training and, and adequate support needs to be placed on how it is that students uh, access technology um, can also make you understand how they do or don't utilize those technologies to access their learning. Um, so all of this comes back to, I think, just this, this recognition that if you wanna meet students or meet faculty where they are, it's important to know where they are. And that means investing the time and the resources to really uncover what are they thinking? What are they feeling? And that informs the change management dynamics that you're trying to, to feed into all of this. Um, so I, I just want to echo what I heard from, from Patty and Peter, because I think that's exactly <clears throat> um, the kind of sy systemic and iterative kind of thinking that's necessary um, to, to make some real progress. Excellent. And there's really good comments in the chat. So continue sharing your experiences. We love hearing from you at the institution. And Peter, I'm going to go a little off plan, but I know that accessibility and security are very, very important in ed tech adoption, especially at the system level. So can you talk about how, as a large system, you've incorporated that into some of the ed tech uh, procurement processes? Yeah, uh, thanks, Megan. Uh, and it's that level of uh, compliance with, um, again, it, really best practices of, around information security, accessibility, and any other uh, practices that to some degree may be externally driven uh, is really important to build at a at an organization level uh, and ac really across the organization uh, at both uh, the uh, grass tops as well as uh, the grassroots and for um, a number of our programs including our accessible technology initiative uh, that is uh, has been in place for many years within the CSU and has really helped us move the needle from a, uh, as a system and to help our individual campuses really understand uh, what those best, best practices are and uh, communicating that uh, to campuses, providing resources uh, for campuses to help engage and uh, uh, continuing to really facilitate those conversations on a regular basis. So 
yeah, there, there are really a lot of layers there. Uh, most of them have to do with how well we communicate about these things uh, to uh, what Patty and um, Omid have, have shared already. I think the how we think about managing those kinds of uh, large changes is really important. Again, the grass tops need to know uh, and have the awareness that these things are important to do, not only because they're uh, a good thing to do, in, in many cases, they're really also the right thing to do uh, in terms of matching with the organization's values. Uh, the grassroots level, uh, practitioners, people that are uh, procuring technology or people that are invo involved in um, advocating or supporting either evaluation, remediation, or support of uh, uh, different risk management or compliance work like accessibility uh, and information security. They have to be engaged on a regular basis, either th uh, through trainings, uh, communities of practice, uh, and having support from a, a system uh, and, and leadership that continues to advocate for uh, th that kind of work to be done. Um, and, and so I'd say between the grass tops and grassroots within the organization, that uh, having both, both of those aspects, I think, helps to create a, uh, and sustain a long-term system approach to being able to incorporate uh, those kinds of practices. I can't uh, emphasize enough the vendor relationship as well. I know uh, it's kind of been hit on a little bit as, uh, as part of this. We've seen how our ability to engage with vendors uh, over certainly the last 10 years has really changed. We don't see as many uh, issues uh, engaging with uh, with vendors around accessibility, uh, you know, asking questions like, "Well, do you have standard accessibility documentation like your your accessibility conformance reports or uh, your VPAT forms?" Uh, vendors seem to be less less likely to say, "What's accessibility or what's a VPAT?" Uh, now compared to what what that looked like ten years ago, um, and I think that's largely to do with the advocacy of institutions in higher education, organizations like the CSU, uh, and uh, 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 taking the initiative to focus on those elements when we're having those conversations, but uh, making sure that that those conversations happen and, and that we have those conversations in the context of a continuum of progress. Uh, you know, we, accessibility, information security, again, these are things that are very human, very messy, uh, and very contextual. And so, you know, getting to are we accessible or are we secure is really more of the journey than the destination. So I think um, having good relationships with vendors and uh, that understand that and understand how uh, it can be mutual, mutually beneficial uh, to move, uh, continue to move the needle in that direction for higher education has been uh, both important for us and I think has, has led to a lot of our success. Excellent, thank you. I know you all had really got some good momentum around creating some system-wide policies and then COVID hit. So like, like most organizations, we had a lot of momentum and then things kind of stalled out and now we have an opportunity to do things a little differently. So Thank let's talk more about the faculty piece. Oh, did anyone else want to jump in on that? Please do. Yeah, I just wanted to just um, just kind of speak to the 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 importance of COVID. Um, I, I I don't think it can be underestimated that it's had a profound effect on the educational landscape and technology in particular. Um, I also just want to sort of from a, a macro level sort of see reflect on what that means um because as we think about the the work that we do um we often have well-intended products or solutions uh, but we we don't always pay special attention to uh, the onus of change that goes into that and what i mean by that is let's say we think a solution ought to have a positive effect on a particular population of students um we sometimes if the the product does not have a positive effect, we'll either blame the students for not engaging, the product for not doing what it was designed to do, 
uh, but not always the system. Um, and I think what's interesting about anytime there is an, uh, an, a change um, is that it's also an opportunity for insight and, and a reflection of what is actually happening. Now, just the, the reason why I jumped into here is because um, uh, one, of the, one of the highlights that we've been capturing as we've been working with students from different groups uh, in their transition into and out and through the pandemic is realizing that as different groups think about technology, there are different experiences that are completely counterintuitive to what we, were, we would have predicted. Specifically, at the dawn of the pandemic, we thought the digital divide will disproportionately disadvantage those under-resourced, underrepresented groups because of the sort of in, uh, uh, this, uh, disadvantaged way in which the technology is, is accessible. Um, surveying these groups across the pandemic, we've actually learned that the first-gen students, the non-traditional students, um, the older students actually have expressed a greater preference for technology-enabled social connection and academic access. Now, this was very surprising because we would have predicted the opposite. Uh, but what it reveals is that maybe there's something with the traditional model that doesn't serve some of these groups in the way that we had thought. And so I do want to just sort of put a pin on, on the importance of change, whether sort of initiated by us or by the world, as a moment of reflection um, to see what does this mean? And, and then also how that plays into that dynamic of onus of change. Right. Is it, the, is it the, the students that we assume ought to be engaging in a certain way? Is it the technology or is it a system and how those, those things interplay? Um, so I, I just think it's really a, a sort of a, 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 an important point to bring up, especially as we think about the role of technology uh, for different groups. And this goes back to our previous, I think, our conversation around access and equity. Because um, I think technology can have a tremendous potential to serve in ways that we may not have been able to in the past, but only if we're mindful of how it is that it's actually being uh, received and, and, uh, and impacted. Yes, thank you for that. I think often in higher education, we think that it's such a luxury to have the opportunity to step back and pause and reflect. But I think at this stage, it's, it's vital to really step back and say what worked, what didn't work. What really happened? Dig, dig in and see some of those trends that weren't necessarily trends or unexpected things. So as we can, I think it's really important as a community to start to surface some of those. So thank you. Anything else before we move on to the next question? Okay, well, let's talk more about faculty. So specifically, what are some of the pragmatic ways that you are working with faculty around strategic adoption and usage evaluation of ed tech? Want to jump in first? Well, I'm I'm happy to uh, chime in on uh, this again, uh, largely from a from an institutional standpoint, looking at what those um, keeping in mind. Uh, I think to what o Omid was just sharing, and and uh, uh, and what Patty I think had discussed as well. All of the different stakeholders uh, when it comes to um, uh, engaging and, and making the, the right decisions, yeah, I, I think is really important. Um, and, uh, I, I think it means making sure that, that we're creating enough time and space, uh, with which to do that. Uh, I, I give a, provide a perfect example. So the, the CSU, uh, about a little over a year ago had launched a, uh, system-wide uh, device technology equity initiative called C Success, and we've been really pleased with how um, the deployment of uh, tens of thousands of devices to our students, uh, as well as uh, thousands of mobile hotspots, really helped to bridge gaps for our students and to help them overcome barriers. Uh, but again, uh, to the I think some of the points that were being made here. Uh, we did this in a way that was uh, to, to really help reach students and to help students get the most out of the experience. 
But I think through the process, we we acknowledged uh, early on and ha uh, have tried to to make sure that we're really thinking about how we deploy technology, such as devices in students' hands, in a, as holistic a way as we can. We know in some ways, just that device having, uh, being in the uh, hands of, of certain students is going to be a, not only an academic game changer for them, but potentially a life game changer. Uh, we've, we heard from students that uh, this, this device that they received was the first computer their family had ever owned. And that goes to the kind of speak to the diversity of the CSU and, and how we're able to support a, a, an incredibly uh, diverse group of individuals with, with so many different kinds of needs. But to bring this back to, to uh, faculty engagement, education technology, you know, the, the idea of having a device in students' hands and be able to have uh, a standard approach to, to be able to access and use technology, there's clearly a, a, a aspect of this that requires uh, faculty engagement and, and for faculty to, to be present and to uh, be supported in thinking about how they engage with the technology that, that's uh, being made available. And I think um, sometimes it's, it's easier said than done because uh, sometimes the technology comes before the conversations uh, uh, happen or, or should be happening. So in those cases, I think it, it's still really important if necessary to sort of maybe pause and reflect to back up and to uh, really look at uh, technology, how it's being implemented, and uh, thinking about uh, how to maximize that engagement with, with faculty. Uh, ultimately, uh, if faculty don't see the value of uh, technology, students may be making a difference in students' lives, but it may not be fully aligning with uh, what I would say could be the most, making the most out of those devices or those technologies. Yeah, and Megan, I'll chime in there. Um, you know, your your question was it, you. The word that really stood out to me is pragmatic, right? And so I'm going to go really, really pra pragmatic in in my response and say, I think one of the things that is often missing is a project manager, right? And I don't I don't care what that role is, what that title is, who does it, um, but there need it needs leadership and it needs maintenance um, of the project, right? You can't just sort of send it out into the wild and expect it to just be successful. Um, you have to have, you really have to have some leadership of it. Um, and I think in, in many cases that can be done in partnership with your ed tech vendor, right? Like we have people who are dedicated to doing that work who can help you um, and give you patterns to follow, examples from other success cases. You know, you don't have to go it alone, but it is really critical that you do have that clear guidance and direction for the project, um, or, or you might not be successful because things will happen. You can have all the hot spots in the world, but what if they don't get to the right people? Or what if they get out there to the right people and they're not really sure how to use them and they don't know who to call to get answers to that? And so you need someone who's committed to doing that. You know, and a lot of times what we find in, in working with institutions is that it's, it's someone's like it's one thing on a very, very big plate full of lots of different things. And it is hard for that person to really make time for it. Um, you, you know, so I think it is really critical to think about who's going to lead this work and how can we, if in the case of ed tech, how can we work with our vendor as a partner to help us meet our goals? Um, I, I think, you know, there are, there are folks like me who have come to ed tech, not because we're so excited about a particular tool, but because we're so excited about the power that ed tech presents in terms of helping institutions meet their goals and solve their problems in efficient ways. And we want to partner with you. We want to hear what's working and what isn't and troubleshoot together and make it work. Ultimately, your success is our success. Um, and so I, I think there are a lot of us in the ed tech space who feel very passionately about partnering with our users on the other end to make sure that things are effective. Um, but, but it really does come down to that very pragmatic element of 
who's going to manage this project and make sure that we are meeting the milestones we've set for ourselves and, and be able to course correct if we're not, um, which I think is also often a problem in, in failed implementation of ed tech tools is that we don't have a plan for how to course correct if everything doesn't go smoothly. Um, but all of those things really come back to project management. I'll, uh, I'll add um, something that's complementary. I feel like finally I have some unique input here, um, which I think in addition to the pragmatic components of, of making sure that you have the infrastructure to implement, uh, that is critical. Um, there's also a very human psych psychological dimension. Um, again, sort of bearing on the insights that we've captured from our faculty survey, when you ask them what is uh, the single most uh, important source that influences you to explore and implement new technologies, it's not from edtech vendors, it's not even from the institution, it's what their peers are using. Um, and it turns out that if that is a single greatest source, it also reveals a missed opportunity because if institutions recognize that there are these small subset of individuals who are the you know the, the early adopters that are influencing those around them there could also be a way in which you can elevate that platform for for those individuals and the people who who sort of are early adopters to feel like they are part of an innovation process give them the supports to do part of your work for you, and then that is what essentially creates an initial sort of wave of change. I've seen this also uh, be an insight that vendors will take advantage of, or, or I would say utilize. And how they do that is they'll often um, reach out to a faculty member and they'll ask them, what are some of the, the tools that you're using? And then they'll say, you know, it seems like you have great insights on this general topic. Would you like to come join us in a webinar much like this <laughs> and share your thoughts and experiences about what your insights and your experiences have been? Uh, and then by the end of it, the faculty become quite likely to adopt whatever it is that the product of the webinar uh, organizers were because now they've sort of been brought in as a champion, as, as someone whose identity can be uh, validated and, 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 and boosted as an innovator. And so they feel compelled to continue that work. So I think in addition to the pragmatism, there's a lot of considerations around the psychology of behavior initiation um, that can really feed into how both administrators and vendors think about the faculty as the gatekeepers, um, ultimately, of those, uh, those implementations. Excellent, thank you. Keeping on theme with the need for a chief cat herder, we've learned that experience here at, at Widgie with some of our tech implementations. So we we are getting to the point where we're gonna jump to the audience Q&A, but I, I quickly wanna ask each of you, maybe just in a sentence or two, to talk about what you've learned with working with ed tech providers, or Patty, you touched on this a little bit, but working directly with institutions. How can you sort of reduce the friction and make sure that you're, on the road to an effective long-term partnership. It's a win-win for both, as well as with the students in mind, ultimately. Well, I think one of the themes that's come up by, from every single one of us today is to really start with stakeholder input, right? Because if you know upfront where your different stakeholder groups are, what assumptions they're coming in with, what level of enthusiasm they have, then you can you can create a plan that is going to be more responsive to the true dynamics. Um, it, you know, I, I think sometimes we make assumptions ab about where people are and, and what their needs are, and, and that's always problematic. Um, no, no more or less problematic in the world of ed tech implementation, but certainly a factor that has to be considered. Uh, so it seems sort of counterintuitive for me to say the thing to do up front is take the time to find out what people are thinking. But it, it is, it's going to save you so much more time in the long run to take that time up front. So I think that's absolutely critical. I also think that once you land on that vendor, you need to put some responsibility on us. And I'll say us here, right, speaking from my role at, at Turnitin, 
come to your partner, your vendor, and say, what are you going to give us to help us support implementation? It can't just be a transaction where you, you sign a check and you put a purchase order in and then, and then we're hands off, right? A good ed tech vendor is going to be your partner, not just in adopting, but also implementing that tool. And they have skills. You know, I think Carol in the chat was talking about, well, uh, institutions often don't have a project management role. Nope, they often don't. But you know where you do have a role like that? You have a role like that in ed tech companies. And you should ask for and expect that kind of support and that kind of partnership with you in making things a success. Um, and we can bring you materials and strategies and steps that we've learned from working with hundreds of thousands of institutions about what works and what doesn't, customize that for your implementation so that it will really work for the goals that you have in mind. But we can do a lot of the work for you. You know, you're talking about how do you get people trained? We can bring that content to you. How do you support students? We have content that can support that. And I think it's, you know, institutions need to come to the table prepared to ask for that and expect it as part of their relationship with a vendor. Patty, I'm going to uh, take what you said and actually go a little bit in a, a different direction, but but related. Uh, I, the, I have no... Um, I have no objection uh, and I, uh, around project management from vendors, and I think that's that's absolutely critical for success, uh, successful implementations of ed tech or any other technologies that institutions are enabling. The the project management at the institution side, and whether you consider it the the sort of the technical project management or the the stakeholder management around. Uh, communication and getting the word out. I think that that partnership right there uh, between project management at the vendor, and again, I'll put in air quotes around it, project management at the institution uh, is really important because whether, again, it is that uh, that project contacts, the the stakeholder or stakeholders that are involved in the, the application, in many cases, they're the ones that uh, can help best identify some of the organizational uh, roadblocks, some of the uh, politics or, or uh, you know, compliance uh, regulation, regulatory policy hoops uh, or barriers that that uh, a, a vendor or a, a, a institution in partnership with that vendor are going to encounter. It's like the inside intelligence in, into into what's happening. So I think uh, making, sh you know, when when possible at all, I, I absolutely agree that uh, vendors, uh, having vendor experience with uh, tackling certain kinds of problems across multiple institutions and how they can bring that experience back to uh, a team at an organization that's thinking about, okay, how do we take those lessons learned? And then how do we really ap apply the the known environmental factors, political, economic factors, uh, and constraints that we have. How do we sort of mash those two together uh, to help keep this approach moving forward? Um, yeah, I can I can only um, so again echo uh, both Patty and Peter's points. Uh, the, the the additional thought that comes to mind is uh, is also an encouragement to four vendors, an encouragement of an investment of an evaluation um, of your your product, not both, not just for a demonstration of like, look how cool our product is and look how effective it is, but really as a basis to really uncover what what areas of improvement there are. Um, I think some of the comments I'm seeing in the chat also touch on this because I think institutions also have a pretty good sense of which vendors have a motivation just to sell versus which ones want to partner. And I think uh, if you yourself are able to instill that mindset of improvement and iteration um, and, and service, then that can eventually come across. Uh, and so there are, there are strategies and, 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 and behaviors that you can begin to implement. Um, that fosters that 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 um, mindset of inquiry, that mindset of improvement, and it begins with trying to take an honest look at whether or not your product is serving in the way that you hope that it does. Um, I'll also share with you that uh, when you are able to 
uh, carve out um, low cost, no cost partnerships with many schools that may not be as well resourced, um, that they are actually quite open to a partnership that demonstrates positive impact before they spend their limited resources on a particular vendor. Um, and that by doing so, you you're, you have the greatest chance of, of having a partnership that creates a tailored solution, um, but also is not going to lead to a closed door because your incoming uh, price offering is a bit too high and you don't have the demonstration of impact um, that the schools are looking for. So uh, broadly speaking, I'd say really just thinking about how it is that you can validate and and uh, and demonstrate the the way that your product does or does not work with the goal of this iterative uh, continuous improvement mindset that helps to, to to foster trust and and build credibility. Excellent. Thank you all for your very thoughtful responses. Clearly, not a question that warranted one to two sentences. So. Um, I'm going to stick with Ahmed on that theme when we go to the audience Q&A, because I think this is right in line with what you were just talking about. How do we make the environment more equitable for the smaller and maybe more innovative ed tech providers? Um, yeah, I would say, again, just sort of repeating that um, uh, the, the, the early stage um, ed tech providers really are the embodiment of innovation. Uh, because they're the most likely to be uh, attuned and, and uh, willing to change and customize their solutions based on the institution's needs. Um, and so thinking about putting into place a process that really helps to uncover what impact, if any, your, your product has is one thing. The other thing I want to sort of unpack, um, especially as we're talking about access, is that access is actually two components, which is... Uh, both having a solution be accessible, so it's it's available, and that it is being accessed by the the end user. And those two things are not always one and the same, um, but that ultimately, if you're trying to increase access, you want to ensure that you are doing both, that you're making a solution and product that is accessible. That means there are no procedural burdens or complexities that prevent the end users, especially in a disproportionate, unjust way from being able to access your platform. But that ultimately there's also equitable accessing of your solution. Um, and that also requires, I think, an intentional exploration of who is using your platform, how are they using it, and who's not using your platform. Um, and, uh, you know, just to sort of close the circle, I, I think those early stage companies who are hungry for understanding how they can best serve the institutions are the best positioned and as a group represent the, the spirit of innovation that the tech ed tech landscape really needs. Um, so if there is a, a sort of systematic process of doing that, exploring whether or not your, your solution is accessed and accessible, and having the impact that you hope that it does, then I think that triad will lead to the greatest chance of having a product solution and a, and a partnership uh, that will set you up for success. Excellent, thank you. Peter, I'm gonna to go to you next with a question from Beth Kiggins. How does FERPA play into the adoption of ed tech tools and the fact that these tools retain student data? Well, uh, we, we have to be able to uh, it's really a balancing act. And so uh, we need to be able to use student uh, data and information to make uh, the right strategic decisions and support students. Uh, at the same time, we know as institutions, we, we have um, regulatory requirements that require us to do things a certain way. And I think to what, what Omid um, was talking about uh, with regards to how, how we get there and um, uh, what that means for our ability to collaborate. I think uh, as far as uh, ed tech, uh, especially uh, smaller ed tech providers go, I, I think this is part of, this becomes part of the conversation and the continuum of growth and the continuum of innovation that has to happen. Maybe it's not something that, that uh, you know, an ed tech provider is concerned with at the outset, but with the knowledge that to be able to grow and to be able to expand, 
that these are the other constraints that need to be taken into account. I think that's really important. So, uh, it, but it, getting back to FERPA, uh, of course, regardless of what tool uh, is being used, I think uh, protecting student information, uh, protecting the data that uh, organizations have is, is really uh, hugely, uh, hugely important. Uh, and I think how, do, how that factors into innovation is, is also important. Are there ways to, to evaluate uh, the success of a, a tool or technology and to minimize the risk of uh, exposing that information? I think that's, those are great conversations to, to have uh, early and often with um, uh, ed tech providers, regardless of size. Very true, thank you. Okay, one last audience question and we'll get to the wrap up. Patty, I'm gonna ask you, how have you seen the balance of tools being adopted and implemented with helping to reduce the chaos and uncertainty, but also making sure that at the, the end user, the student isn't gonna have additional chaos, additional stress or additional costs? Yeah, so, so this is hard, right? Like, let me just say that up front. I'm not going to gloss over this. This is really, really challenging, right? Because, you know, when you're saying things like, oh, well, evaluate what's best and be responsive to innovation and, you know, be prepared to course correct, what can happen is that you have a lot of change. And there's a burden that gets carried by the end users when you start talking about a significant amount of change. So I think there's a balance that you really have to strike between sort of evaluating what the tools are and how they're being used and what you're asking of the users, right? It's part of the reason why I said before, it's not just pause and reflect and make a change, it's pause, reflect and prioritize. And part of prioritizing is thinking about your end users and not just thinking at a big level, right? Like uh, we have to think about what is the burden we're asking students to carry. I, I think somebody earlier in the chat was talking about a shift from LMS to LMS, right? Um, which can be a really feel like a very instructor uh, institutional level decision, but it has an impact on students too. When we're asking them to change their workflows, when we're asking them to change their mindsets, you know, I, it's, it's my job at the company that to be actually the voice of students and teachers in part that's what that's part of the responsibility I carry at the company and and uh, and some of my partners at turn it in will tell you I take that quite seriously sometimes to my detriment uh, they don't always love it when I'm the person who walks in the room and I'm like oh, whoa, 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 wait a minute wait a minute wait a minute because you move that button and it doesn't seem like a big deal but it is a big deal in that moment if you don't know where the button you always push to do xyz is and so I do think you have to be really thoughtful and have a plan, right? And you have to be mindful of when you evaluate, when you make a change, how you roll it out. Do you do it on a small scale? What are the supports that you put in place um, to, to, to do that over time? A lot of times we advocate for like a dual um, access period. If you're shifting from one to another, give people time to make that shift. Let them opt in to the change for a period of time before you make it mandatory, right? And be thoughtful about how you bring people over. Um, and I think one of the things you can do is often ease some of the anxiety that comes with change that is just about not knowing what this new is, whatever is new. Um, and so you wanna, you wanna bring champions into that conversation, people who can speak to the value of the change, why it is better to make this shift, what it will look like on the other side. So I think there's a lot that's there is about really understanding the people that are involved and being strategic about the moves that you're making. And sometimes part of the strategy has to be, it's not the right time to make this move. That is a decision that is okay to make, uh, right? And to be thoughtful about how you implement and what you implement and how it falls into your priorities. Um, you know, so, I, so I, I think a lot of it is just about sort of the personalization of understanding who your stakeholders are and how you're gonna roll things out and then doing everything you can to, I call it looking around around corners, right? Look around the corner and anticipate what the challenge is that's coming and be ready for it. Have supports in place. You know, these kinds of questions are going to come up. How can we be prepared to answer them? You know that students are going to be, it's going to be 1159 before the thing is due and they're not going to be able to figure out how to submit. 
How do you prepare for that in advance? So there's a lot we can do up front that will ease some of that anxiety, but it also does involve really just that core knowledge of who you're serving and how to best meet their needs. Wow. Well, thank you, everybody. I'm so grateful that I got to spend time with you all. And then the chat, I can't wait to dig further into the, the conversations that took place. But I want to pass it off to Kim very quickly to wrap us up. But Patty, Peter, Ahmed, thank you very much for being so generous with your time and your advice today. Kim. Great. Thank you so much. I want to echo Megan's thanks to Omid, uh, Patty, and Peter uh, for your insights and conversation today. Thank you to our audience for joining us and being engaged with your questions and chat. Again, we will be sharing out the recording um, in a follow-up email. Visit our website. We have two webcasts, two more webcasts coming up um, in the next couple of weeks, and then our annual meeting will be in person in Denver. There is still time to register, and we hope to see you there. I want to quickly acknowledge all of our sponsors and supporting members that make much of our work here at WCET possible. Thank you again, everyone. Take care. <laughs>